Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday evening Bible study, Friendship Blessing Church. I'm Pastor Kevin Smith. Today is October 27th. Okay, so now all the greeting formalities out of the way. Um, most of you probably are well aware what you're joining <laughs> on to, but uh, you've joined uh, a 13-week Bible study in the book of let me hear everybody say it in the book of Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If I've got my numbers right, um, we're on week 11, which means, I said it last week, but we're almost there. I mentioned last week, our next study is going to be a 12-week study in Luke, and I can confirm that um, the reading plan is on our website. I checked it out myself. So I know that it's there. Genesis is going to stay there. We take off the third one or three reading plans ago. Um, and so Genesis will still be on there, but uh, you can check out our Luke uh, reading plan coming up. As soon as we're done with this one, just a few more weeks left, including night. I think that means three weeks left. So grab your Bibles and open up to Genesis chapter 37, and we're going to get started, but let's begin with a word of prayer, as always. Father, we're here. We're excited about being here. Um, Father, uh, the biggest reason is to learn more from your word. Father, I'm grateful uh, for what we've learned in between, whether it's been reading through uh, Genesis, or in each one of our own uh, time uh, spent in your word to learn from you. And so, Father, I just pray right now that you will, through the power of your spirit, give us understanding of your word, that you will teach us. You'll be our teacher tonight as we, um, Father, begin to enter into this story about Joseph. And, and Father, I pray for application for each and every one of us that there'll be life application, that, that we'll think about our own lives, our relationship to other people, the greatest commandment, to love you and to love others as ourselves. Um, and, and Father, we want to grow in those. We want to live them out. Um, Father, as we get to know you more and better each and every day. So this time is yours tonight. Use it for your kingdom and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we've uh, finally arrived at one of my favorite stories in the Bible. I think I mentioned it in prayer, the story of Joseph. Um, I, might, I might even say my favorite story in the Bible. All the stories of the Bible are incredible to me, and I love to study them. But this, this story of Joseph, for me, just tugs at my heart, has so many different personal applications to life, to ministry, to the church. And so now we've already had Joseph in the story. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on who is Joseph, right? We brought him into the story through Jacob's little family tree here. Remember last week, we'll talk about this in a minute, but Jacob's name's been changed to Israel. But Joseph is Rachel's son. Um, Jacob's, the love of Jacob's life, it was Rachel that he wanted to marry. Remember, his father-in-law deceived him into marrying the older sister first. But anyway, Rachel gives birth to Joseph. Uh, Joseph is um, Rachel's oldest son. Benjamin's going to, well, already did enter into the story, right? Uh, when Rachel gave birth and, and unfortunately passed away in that story. Um, but this is her firstborn of two children she's going to have. So let's look at that timeline that I've had uh, most weeks, I think key events in the life of Isaac, Israel. Now we know who we're talking about. When I first put this up, we hadn't got, gotten to Jacob's name change. And Joseph, this bottom 
line uh, bar, Joseph's life, we're going to begin to track that story now through to the end of Genesis. So last week, um, we um, touched on that, that journey, Jacob's return um, to back to his home, his encounter with Esau, his wrestling, I added that in here, you won't see that on past weeks, but wrestles with God, his wrestling with God and his name changed to Israel. We didn't go over this incident with Dinah at all. I mentioned it, we passed by it. And then the birth of Benjamin, I simply mentioned chapter 35, Rachel died in childbirth, Benjamin survived, the baby survived and lived. And so now this week, we enter into the story of Joseph, um, who has dreams. He's a dreamer. His, his brothers call him that dreamer. Um, and through uh, some uh, terrible circumstances, family dysfunction and problems, Joseph's going to end up sold off as a slave to Egypt. And we're going to finish up tonight. Um, he ends up um, being accused of something he didn't do by Potiphar's wife. Um, and so uh, we'll finish up with that tonight. I don't, I, I'm tempted to stop here and begin, you know, the description of that part of the story. And we're not going to do it. We're going to, we're using this timeline just to kind of keep track of where, we're, where we've been and where we're headed. So chapter 37, remember last week finished at 37 verse one. So we're gonna pick this up at verse two. And as usual, I'm not gonna make it very far, but let me read for you. This is the account of Jacob's family line. I just wanna stop right there because then if you read, um, it, it's interesting for me anyway, when I read that this is the account of Jacob's family line, not correctly, by the way, but the image that came to mind was what I expect to follow is a genealogy. Um, like if you go back to Genesis chapter 10, verse one, by the way, that phrase, this is the account, very common phrase. Okay, and, and often what follows is a genealogy, a family lineage, the, the uh, very uh, repetitious accounting of who was born to who. So like in chapter 10, verse one, this the account of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Noah's sons, who themselves have sons after the flood. And then it lists the sons, the sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Medai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tiras. And then you can read it, and it's this genealogy. Um, and the same thing in chapter 11, ch uh, a couple of times in chapter 11, chapter 25. But when you read this 37, it's not really a genealogy. As a matter of fact, what I would say is this. I, I wrote a little phrase, what follows. I would say that this is the account of Jacob's family line, especially of Joseph and how Jacob's family, Israel's family, even Israel the nation, right, goes from Canaan to Egypt as preparation for them to be the nation of Israel. So now the nation is taking form and it's going to happen. Uh, a big part of that story is going to happen in their time in Egypt, um, to, you know, to become what God wants them to be. So I found another map that I think might be helpful. I would call this, I think I would call this Joseph's Journeys map. There was no title on this map. But we're not going to go over the numbers. You know, we will we'll return to this map in just a little bit. Um, but I just, as we kind of get an idea of what's going on now, uh, I wanted to use this, this map. So if you remember Abraham's nightmare back in chapter 15, a few lessons ago, I'm calling it a nightmare. Um, you can go back there and read it. And that's the chapter where God makes a covenant with Abraham, promises him many descendants, 
the land that he can see. But God also said, I'm going to quote here, verse 13, know for certain that for 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country. Here we are, not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. So here we go. Um, and what I mean, we're, we're going to Egypt now. Um, and like I said, we're going to come back to this map and check out these numbers, but uh, we're going to go with Joseph. Joseph, one man, one person, is going to lead the way for the whole nation of Israel to end up in Egypt. So, so we're starting this story. I mentioned already, but here's another thing we're going to see as well, some more family dysfunction, dysfunctional stuff. Remember, um, and then we won't have to, we don't spend a lot of time on it this evening. This is God, what we've been learning in Genesis is God working through our brokenness. And here's another story of God working through our brokenness not approving of our brokenness, but working through the brokenness. Um, since the fall, when we decided to sin and to go against God and do wrong, God's working through the brokenness. So remember uh, Jacob's mother and father, Isaac and Rebecca, and how they had played favorites. Um, Esau uh, was Isaac's favorite, and Jacob was Rebecca's favorite. Now, Jacob is going to play favorites and big time. I mean, this he's going to play. It's really, really, it was obvious in the Isaac and Rebecca story. It's going to be very uh, uh, obvious here. And by the way, I'd say in both cases, it created big family strife. So I even thought about going into that playing favorites. Um, most of us parents try hard and think that we don't, <laughs> but the biblical account reminds us that it's really, really hard um, to not do that. So I want to do some reading here. Let's pick this up at um, chapter 37, verse 2, and I'll call this letter B, the second half, because I read this is the account of Jacob's family. Now let's pick it up at Joseph, okay? And I'm just going to read a couple of verses here through verse 4. Joseph, a young man of 17, that's significant, so we get his age there, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Wow, that doesn't sound good, right? Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, so it's obvious, uh, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Wow. <laughs> wow. See what I mean about family strife and brokenness and dysfunctional things that are taking place here. Um, playing favorites by a parent is obvious. So I told you, I think the first thing I'd note is uh, Joseph is 17 years old in verse two here. And so that means that he's 17 years old when he's taken into slavery to Egypt. So we got a significant time point there in Jacob's life, make, or excuse me, Joseph's life. I'm going to get, I'm going to butcher these names. I'm not careful in Joseph's life. So can you imagine 17 years old and, and what we're going to hear now, right? I don't want to get too much of it away. But in um, verse three, we find out that Jacob loved Joseph more than any of the other sons. And the text says, because he'd been born to him in his old age. Um, and so uh, remember, I pointed this out when we went through it the uh, first time, remember that uh, Joseph was born to Rachel, the, the loved wife, um, and I don't know any other way to put it, and so far in this story, it's not necessarily Jacob's fault, 
um, when you go back to the deceit of his father-in-law, his uncle Laban, and he ended up with Leah after seven years of serving him. And, and then he had to serve seven more years, but Rachel became a wife and then their servants, their handmaidens. And I won't rehash all that story. I just want you to see this family strife and dysfunction. So Rachel's the loved wife. Um, and when you know the story, uh, you understand why these kids, by and large, knew probably that their moms weren't as loved as Rachel, and that Rachel was the special mother. So that makes Joseph what? <laughs> the spoiled brat, right, to the other um, siblings. Um, so they, these, these siblings had to know their mothers weren't loved in the same way. And, and I pose the question here, can you imagine, you know, the feeling of these other uh, siblings, um, and they made Joseph here look very special, and, and so, and I think appropriately. Um, it, but, so, you, it's easy to notice here that Joseph plays into favorite son also. Did you notice, I pointed it out when I read through it, but in verse two, and he brought their father a bad report to them, so as a young person, he's playing into that favorite son as a tattletale. I'm sure that doesn't help. Jacob seals the deal. I didn't know how to say it any other way by giving uh, Joseph a special coat, tunic, robe. It's translated in different ways. That What was it, uh, that verse? It's in verse three, and he made an ornate robe for him. And this will bring back images for many of you, not all of you, if you're not familiar with the story, but for many of you as a child in Sunday school, um, learning the Bible, maybe even outside of Sunday school, um, and you heard of this story as Jacob's coat of many colors. But we're, this is where it gets kind of interesting in digging deeper into the Bible, into the Word of God. Because um, if you have a study Bible, which I've encouraged all of you to get, matter of fact, if you're not sure how to get one, get a hold of me, message me, email me, whatever, and, and I'll help you pick a study Bible. But if you have a study Bible at that word ornate, if, if that's the way it translates it, you'll see a letter, footnote, to the bottom of the page, mine has it, and it says, the meaning of the Hebrew for this word is uncertain, also in verses 23 and 32 that use the same word, and in the NIV that I'm using with you tonight, uh, all three places translate that uh, ornate. Now, if if you <laughs> if you grow up with this image of this coat of many colors, I'm gonna um, uh, mess that up a little bit. Not a lot, but mess it up um, a little bit. But the actual uh, Hebrew word that we're certain. Of, you know, the first thing I thought is to figure out what's going on here. I wanted to look at multiple translations like we do and see how they compare. So I just throw them all up here at once for you. Here's the one that we read, the NIV. He made an ornate robe for him. The ESV, which many of you have probably, he made him a robe of many colors. That's that phrase you're familiar with. And then the KJV that some of you use, he made him a coat of many colors. The only difference there is that the word colors is different. That's King James, well, 1611. Uh, Old English spelling is simply why that's a little different. Um, and then you'll see the word many. The New King James Version has it the same way, is italicized. And the reason that it's italicized is, and I'll just tell you, and you can dig on this, that word many is not there. It, it's In the Hebrew, it's not it's not there. And it's debated as to what, whether the word colors should be in there. This is interesting paraphrase. And this is actually probably closer to the, to the, an exact translation. So I rarely say that in a paraphrase, but I'm going to say it here. Made a long robe with full sleeves for him. Good news translation. 
And then the Young's literal, which I think is often, um, you know, makes an attempt to get something close to an exact translation. Remember, if you went through that lesson with me, impossible to exactly translate, and hath made for him a long coat. So how do you get many colors and then end up with some translations saying long, long sleeves uh, or Nate? So the next thing we need to do is look at the Hebrew word. Now, in my notes, I hope I didn't say this. I said Greek. We're in the Old Testament. So, um, so you can see it's easy to get confused over language, but the original language here definitely was Hebrew. So let me make sure I get my words right. I said Greek. Scratch that. The original Hebrew here. So um, and this, this is going to sound crazy to you, but the original Hebrew words not often used. Matter of fact, I think one other time in the Old Testament, one of the ways that we understand what it means is the, is the rep, uh, when a word is repeated and you can research all the places it's used. Um, so not able to do that here, but um, the word flat of the hand or foot flat of the hand or foot, noun. Um, by the way, when you see masculine or feminine, you'll have to do language studies. That doesn't mean in our mind, we get the image of men and women, and that's not what it means at all. A matter of fact, when I learned Portuguese, I had to learn this, the masculine and feminine of, of words. And so that would take deeper study to understand it, but doesn't, doesn't matter for us here, um, but it's a noun. And actually the idea of flat meaning like long to the hand and down to the feet. So I'm, I'm adding a little bit <laughs> there to help get an understanding, but it's really hard to get to this coat of many colors, which is where we're really trying to, whoops, where we're trying to head. So here's a further breakdown of possibilities uh, with this word. The palm of the hand or sole of the foot flat, long down, by implication, a long and sleeved tunic, perhaps simply a wide one from the original sense of the root of many breaths. Possibly because of outside usage of the word in other ways, and actually culturally their clothing, we'll talk about that in a second, diverse, colors. So where, so how is it that we actually get to that? And I want to read a commentary for you, Ellicott's commentary, that, that helps a little bit more um, with this. And, and the goal here is, first of all, to get to what matters, because um, uh, sometimes it's kind of crazy how we'll study what doesn't really matter so much to understanding the purpose or the application of the text. But um, the goal is to get to that. What's the application? We get distracted sometimes. I, in some ways, this might be a distraction, but let me read it for you. Two explanations are given of this phrase. The first, that it was a long garment with sleeves or fringes. The other, that it was composed of patchwork of various colors. The latter is the more probable interpretation. Now watch this. For from the tomb at Beni Hassan, we learned that such dresses were worn in Palestine. So what you've just done now is gone into a historical cultural study of the time, not even language, but from other historical things that they have found as a train of captive Jebusites is represented upon it clad in rich robes, the patterns of which seem to have been produced by sewing together small pieces of different colors. So what does all, you know, what does all this mean? That we get that coat of many colors from historical records, cultural records, this one in particular, where we find that that not necessarily the word, but the clothing that is referred to probably fits into 
what we know historically outside the Bible and stuff about the time and about the kind of tunic or cloak that Joseph would have um, gotten from his dad. Um, it definitely would have been ornate, um, probably multicolored, which was a sign of wealth because to dye things took uh, significant wealth. So, so what's the point? <laughs> you know, because I kind of said we get off on the details that don't really matter. So what's the point? Well, I think here, here's here's the point for us, um, and everybody agrees pretty much on this. Father Jacob set Joseph apart from everyone else and maybe even made a statement if it's right about these outside records of this type of tunic that was multicolored with a patchwork. Um, uh, it was the more important people that had to, had those even given to royalty. And, uh, and so the evidence point to, points to that kind of a cloak of many color, uh, colors that made that person stand out in a crowd. So the point for me, when you read these brothers' reactions, it begins to make sense. I mean, because um, if you look in 37, the next verse is now verses five. So Joseph's, Joseph's going to have dreams now, okay? So we're trying to build to put this whole thing. To, Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. I think in a surface read, you read this about being hated and one, and them wanting to kill him. We're going to find a few, uh, some verses later. It starts to make some sense, okay? He said to them, verse 6, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheep rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. <laughs> His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he said. Then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. So this coat of many colors, this tunic with long sleeves, whatever it was, his brothers, I, and, and as a matter of fact, let me, let, me, uh, let me come back to that, right? Well, let me point out to you, first of all, in verse 10, even his dad gets, this is so over the top, even, his, and his dad's been a part of this, right? Jacob, Israel is a part of this. Verse 10, when he told his father as well as his brother, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you have? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. So his father's not, his father rebukes him. He's not all the way there yet, but his father actually, it, for some reason, interpreted that he's going to be bowing down to him too. And then over in verses 37, 18 through 20, it, the crescendo gets even louder, right? So verse uh, 18, but they saw him in the distance <clears throat> and we're, he's going to travel to them. His dad sends him to them alone. Um, actually, let me read, um, uh, well, the uh, second half of verse 17. So Joseph went after his brothers and found him near Dothan, but they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, he plotted to kill them. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns. So you begin to get the picture um, not that their feelings are uh, appropriate feelings, um, but we sometimes begin, we, we somehow begin to understand what's going on here. Back to this picture. So we've got their mothers being less loved than Rachel, Joseph, a favored son, blatantly giving, given a tunic or robe that makes him stand out beyond 
everybody else. He has these dreams that appear to say they're going to be bowing down to him, and now they want to kill him. You know, one of my thoughts here was, as we think about family dysfunction and God working through our brokenness of sin, if your family's going through pain, I've preached this and said this before, look for the backstories. I mean, this is three generations. We're talking about infertility. We're talking about stories of deception and brokenness and favored kids. Look for the backstories. Three generations this has been happening in this family. And you know what I tell people is, I, I don't mean look for the backstory so you can validate people's wrongs. It helps you to understand what's going on in your family and to deal with the situations better. Um, just, just, a, just a thought. I might expand on that at some other time, but uh, just a thought as we think about what we're seeing in this story. <clears throat> so the brothers devise a plan to kill him tell their dad that a wild animal ate him. And the oldest brother, this is so incredible to me, the oldest brother, Reuben, steps in. <clears throat> and the reason I say that is, and I'm not going to go into detail. I know I've counseled for years and helped families. And uh, there's something to family birth order. And I'll just say it this way. <clears throat> if anybody would have hated Joseph, it would have been the oldest son, Reuben, um, who would have been the most hurt and jealous and whatever else. <clears throat> but he steps in, verse th uh, chapter 37, verse 21, when Reuben heard this, this plot about killing him and telling their dad that a wild animal ate him, when Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood throw him into this cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. See, see what I, the emotion in this story, amazing. So Reuben plans on saving him, saving his life. They throw him into the cistern. They buy into what Reuben has said. Uh, which is a well, right? And the text tells us it didn't have water in it. It was dried up. Reuben plans to come and get him, but the other brothers, before Reuben can get to him, end up selling him to some Ishmaelites, Midianites. And I'm just trying to run quickly through the scripture. Remember the Ishmaelites, um, the descendants of Ishmael? Remember that whole thing? Ishmael and Isaac um, by the way, there's, there's this uh, skepticism over these Ishmaelites and Midianites. You go study that, you'll find out that they're the same people. And the story of the journey of Israel to Egypt prophesied in chapter 15 has now kicked into high gear. So let me, this is where I said I'd come back here. Chapter 37, I, I did some numbering here. Um, in verse 14, this all starts out in Hebron, Hebron, however you say that. See the number one here in uh, of chapter 37, verse 14, then he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. Uh, uh, so Jacob, Israel, did that to Joseph. He sent him after his brothers. And then um, verse 14, when Joseph arrived at Shechem, this is still verse 14, um, tracking after his brothers. Uh, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, what are you looking for? And he gets the information that his brothers have gone to Dothan, and he goes there. So in verse 17, so Joseph went up after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Now you jump all the way over to verse 36. Meanwhile, well, meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar. So Joseph, 17 years old, makes his way um, as a slave with these Ishmaelites to Egypt, and he's sold into slavery in Egypt. And we're in high gear now for the nation of Israel, for Israel, for the whole family of Jacob to end up in 
Egypt, okay? So then in chapter 38, we have a very dramatic story about Judah, one of the 12 brothers, um, uh, and Tamar, his daughter-in-law. Very tough reading, tough stuff to read. Matter of fact, you read it, wonder why we didn't, just time's sake, and I'm on this story of Joseph. So you do your digging. Go back and dig on that. You get questions, feel free to pop them out to me. Um, then we meet back up with Joseph in chapter 39. So jump over to 39. Uh, in, in Egypt, um, so verses one and two, let's pick him back up with Potiphar. And we're going to find out a little bit about Pot Potiphar. Now, Joseph, verse one, chapter 39, had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian, who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Jacob so that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. I had started down this thing of studying deeper on who Potiphar was, but we're just going to go with what the text says in verse one, that he was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. So very important person with direct connection to, to Pharaoh, it appears like. Joseph gains respect and authority from his master, Potiphar. Potiphar puts him in charge of all his possessions. You read about that in the verses that follow. It even says that God blesses Potiphar because of Joseph. So Potiphar's everything is prospering and Joseph is gaining in respect and authority. However, it's what I said about this story. Not everything is going to turn out well. Um, in this chapter, you know, and here's where I just, I want to say this, this thought hit me a long time ago. I've preached it. I've mentioned it. Joseph is probably one of the biggest people in history. You know how sometimes you, you'll, um, how did I put this? How do I say this? Have you ever done what was right and ended up having bad happen for it? We call it undeserved wrong undeserved tragedy, undeserved bad. If there is anybody in history <laughs> that deserves kind of the title of undeserved wrong, Joseph um, has, and, and we're kind of, it's already been happening, right? I mean, he's a kid, he's 17 years old, angry brothers because of family dysfunction. He's sold into slavery. They want to kill him. He's sold into slavery. Now he's in Egypt. He gains this respect and authority, and now undeserved, really serious, undeserved wrong is going to be happening to him. And nearly all of Joseph's story is one of undeserved wrong. So now in verse, I want to pick it up, verse 6. Of verses six and seven, and Mrs. Potiphar comes into the story now. Okay, Mrs. Potiphar. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care, 39.6. Um, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now, Joseph was well-built and handsome. Uh-oh, uh -oh, problem. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. And so Mrs. Potiphar takes note of him and she's up to no good in verse 10. And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. Um, so Joseph is, cho is choosing the high road. The incredible applications for our generation we live in and the whole question of sexual issues and sexuality and, and celibacy. And here Joseph is a young man with respect and authority, and he's choosing the high road um, with his master, with his master's household. Um, I, I, we don't have time to spend on, on, on all of that. You just take note as you go through this, that this Joseph is doing incredibly right, just stuff, and he's going to end up reaping some really bad things. Um, well, I wouldn't say reap. I don't think they're the because of the good that he'd done. We get confused about, about all of that. Um, and so um, in verses, oh, actually, I had, an, I had an image for you. 
that I thought was pretty good for this whole. So Mrs. Potiphar is trying to force him, right? There's some pieces I left out of this, this, uh, this story because he runs off in in one in a particular situation here he runs off and leaves his cloak and she tells everybody that joseph tried to rape her tried to force himself on her so the big question then becomes so what's going to be potiphar what's going to be mr potiphar's reaction to this whole thing right so, and that's in verses 19 and 20 of chapter nine, when his master heard the story his wife told him saying that, and by the way, she told everybody, the other servants and everybody that it was Jacob that was trying to force her. This is uh, Joseph. Uh, so <laughs> if I've done that throughout this whole thing, you just make the adjustments, right? <laughs> you'll, you, if you're reading the text, you'll know who I'm talking about. Joseph um, she tells everybody that Joseph tried to force himself on her. So in verse 19 and 20, when his masters heard the story, his wife told him, saying, this is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph master, Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. Now, it almost seems like maybe Potiphar doubted his wife a little just simply because, you know, and I'm not going to go into detail, but the normal reaction would have been to put Joseph, what, to death. And he puts him in prison. So it, it makes you wonder if, if he didn't, uh, if Potiphar didn't wonder uh, a little bit. So here we are. Joseph's done no wrong. He gets accused of a terrible thing. Um, and Joseph ends up in prison. Can you imagine a prison then? dungeon, whatever your imagination is, right? So I don't, I haven't done this on the online version a lot, but I, I want to do it here. So I want you to do some thinking by next week. It, it kind of begs a question. Why did bad come into Joseph's life, even though he'd done nothing, nothing wrong? Matter of fact, I don't know if you noticed back in verse two, it said the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. Well, if the Lord was with Joseph in verse two, why couldn't the Lord have done something about this terrible situation? It, it, you know where it really digs into that question, why do bad things happen to good people? One of the biggest questions of all of humanity. And here we've got a glimpse of some of the reasons why. So you, you work on that um, a little bit by next week. And we're going to, that'll be our starting point um, next week. I think I have one more slide up here. I, I have rarely done this. I should have done this more often for you. So next week, our reading is Genesis 40, verse 1 through 45, verse 28. And we're going to grab a hold of a big piece, some of the more emotional parts to this story of Joseph. Okay, let me close this in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Thank you for giving us, Father, we think about those questions like why do um, bad things happen to good people? And we look at this story of Joseph and we're so grateful for it. In your wisdom, um, Father, stories like this are in your word um, so that we can learn. And when we're going through tough stuff, maybe somebody watching online right now is going through some very difficult things and might ponder, hear this, this uh, very good person Joseph, who's making good decisions, wise decisions, has all kinds of good things happen to him. And then we already know in this story, for no apparent reason, some bad things happen to him. Father, be with each person, might be in the middle of difficulty right now. Give them your spirit, your presence of understanding, wisdom. Your word tells us that we can ask for wisdom, and you give it generously without finding fault. Peace to each and every home that passes all understanding. I pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, God bless. You know what I'm going to say? Have a God week. See you next week.